<sighs> I am stressed. I have a big fair coming up where I'm gonna be selling my jewelry and I am absolutely not prepared for it. So today it's gonna be a production day and I thought I would bring you with me and also answer some of the questions that you asked on Instagram and on YouTube about the business and how to start that and how it's going. So let's get started. This is how I keep my siglas for the earrings. Uh, they are attached onto a cardboard with some double-sided tape. This is so they're already ready when I want to make a pair of earrings and I don't have to like spend hours trying to find a matching pair. Should we go green? Should we go blue? Hmm. I think today I'm gonna start small. I'm just gonna make a pair of earrings, a pendant and a ring. I'm gonna start by measuring the bezel for those um, siglas and the first question that I'm gonna be answering is one that popped up a few times which is how do you start making jewelry what was the idea behind it and the story so when I was in my 20s I went to India for a couple of months and over there I saw beautiful beads beautiful stones and when I came back I thought mm, maybe I could make something with those um, and so I opened my Etsy shop and I started making very simple basic jewelry and to be honest I was working at the time it wasn't really it was more of a hobby um, and then a few years later I saw online I think that really close to my house there was this beach where you could find sea glass and really cool sea glass and I went and since then I have been absolutely hooked the beach that I'm referring to is CM in the northeast of England where you can find really unique sea glass that you can't find anywhere else in the world. So I started implementing sea glass in my jewelry and really I wanted to work with silver but I always found it quite scary because well silver is more expensive than the materials that I was using before and it just I just thought that I would need formal training to be able to learn um, until I went to Canada to house sit at a really lovely lady's house and she had a studio where she had um, all the necessary to start silversmithing and so I was like okay this is a sign <laughs> and I started learning over there how did I learn did I take a course on silversmithing no I've learned everything on my own through YouTube wonderful YouTube creators that make wonderful content and books one side of me would have liked to do a course um, so that I could have a more structured approach and so that I could have somebody to ask questions and check if I'm doing things right. But then on the other side I've met people that have gone to school for this and none of them has stayed in the field because uh, they kind of got sick of it. So maybe it's a good thing that I haven't gone to do a formal um, training. And somebody also asked which tools you need to start making jewelry and it depends so much on the kind of jewelry that you want to make but for the basic basic stuff you just need a pair of flat nose pliers, a pair of round nose pliers and something to cut your wire. For silversmithing it's a bit more complicated and again it depends on the kind of stuff that you want to make but again I'll leave in the description bar a link to a video that explains all of that really well. How do you get past the fear, financial and imposter syndrome and actually start doing it? This is a hard, hard but good question. Um, let's start with the imposter syndrome. I've been doing this for 15 years, it still hasn't gone away. So I don't know what to say other than just do it anyway and try to not listen to it. I think it's always going to be there. It might get a little bit less loud the more you do it and the more you see that actually people enjoy what you're making but I don't know any tricks for getting rid of it. I would look at it like a Debbie Downer in your family, somebody that says, oh, you're never gonna be able to do that, that's too hard. I, if you're like me, you're gonna be like, I'm gonna show you that I'm gonna be able to do that. And so I would look at the imposter voice in your head at the same, the same way. In terms of the financial fear, I think this is a reasonable thing to think about. And I'll be totally transparent, I've been doing this for a long time and I have a big following on YouTube. Um, I have people that look at the things that I do and I still cannot make a full income out of it. I would not be able to pay my bills just out of the jewelry. And yes, it is also because I spend more time doing other things. If maybe I just concentrated doing this, then maybe I would make a full income. But this is just to give you an idea um, 
I think it's really good that you think about this and one side of me is like yes jump on your passion and you're gonna be able to do what you want to do and you're gonna succeed but then the other side of me is like you don't want to put in in a situation where you're struggling financially or that you regret doing this jump so it's yeah you want to keep your job and I would say you want to see that your business is growing every month and that you're making constant income from it, income that could cover all your bills for at least like six months to a year before you jump into making this full time. And I would work on having a big fat emergency fund, like at least six months emergency fund because you just don't know what could happen. We could have another pandemic where people are not buying any superficial objects, um, not superficial, but like not primary need stuff. Or you could have an injury or an illness where you have sore hands and you can't work for a few months. So I would definitely recommend being very careful with your finances. I didn't follow any of those things, to be honest, so I'm not really an example to follow. Um, but if an, a friend was to come to me and say like, you know, I want to be myself, my boss, my own boss, then I would definitely, definitely say prioritize your emergency fund and making sure they have a stable constant flow of income from the side business for at least six months to a year before you jump full time on it. My daughter was a trained silversmith jeweler but had to give it up as her neck and shoulders became too painful. Yes, she had proper jewelers bench and she took many breaks. How do you deal with physical problems like that? First of all, I feel for your daughter. I also have experienced neck and shoulder pains and it's awful. And I'll start by saying that I actually don't have a jeweler's bench and I'm just using a table that was already here. It was actually a table outdoors and I brought it up, up and yeah, it's just a normal table. So I'm thinking of a way of making it either the whole table higher up or just having a little station that's higher up. Uh, that way you don't have to crouch down. But in terms of chair, I do have a tip. When I started working on the studio, I was using just a gym ball, those inflatable gym balls, and I thought it would help me keep my back straight while also move around. But I realized that it wasn't stable at all, and so it was getting quite dangerous, especially when soldering. So then I went to a secondhand shop and I found like a small ergonomic chair, but I found after a week that it wasn't really allowing me to move side to side, and so I would keep tripping on the carpet. And in fact, I was doing a live stream on Instagram and I fell. I was trying to reach something and I just felt like a huge bag of potatoes. Can you see? You have Vongola there on the back. <laughs> so when Flex Spot, who is also the sponsor of this video, reached out to see if I wanted to try their C7 ergonomic chair, I jumped on the occasion. The chair came with easy to follow instructions and only took about 20 minutes to assemble. When I tried this chair for the first time in the studio, I was flabbergasted by how comfortable it was and obviously I knew it would be comfortable but I didn't know that a chair could be this comfortable. This chair is designed to give you the perfect back support in any sitting position. The adaptive lumbar support conforms to the spine when seated so you won't need to add cushion to keep your back straight. Pretty much every part of this chair is adaptable. Its height is 3D armrests and headrest and seat depth. The seat can also be tilted forward, which is a must for jewelry making or any jobs where you need to lean forward. The seat is bigger than other ergonomic chairs, making any sitting position super comfortable. The C7 chair allows you to lean back up to 128 degrees. At first I thought I was breaking the chair, but now I've learned to trust FlexiSpot and enjoy the stretch. FlexiSpot offers a 10 year guarantee where they send you direct replacement for any damaged parts and they also offer a 30 day return policy so if you don't find the chair as comfy as I do, you can return it no problem. FlexiSpot is running some great deals for Black Friday and you may also run the chance of winning a free order. You can shop their range of ergonomic chairs, standing desks and more and by using my code 24BFC7 at checkout, you can save an extra $50 on the C7 chair. Treat yourself and your back this Black Friday. Also, Deidre, thank you for this question. It was the perfect segue to the sponsor. You made things so easy. <laughs> it's the day after, as you can see. Um, I had to go to the vet yesterday because Vongor is a bit sick and I'm waiting for some results. Um, I'm not gonna get into it because I get quite anxious. So we're gonna <laughs> distract ourselves by doing some jewelry. Well, to finish off the one of yesterday. Yesterday, I basically just soldered the bezel to the back plate and added some decorations um, but the next question that you had was mostly about materials um, how ethical are the materials you use for the jewelry and what natural materials have you used so as I said right now I just want to work with Sigla's that's all and 
I think in terms of sustainability as impact, we are very quite low because um, this is waste material that you just find at the beach. And in, compared to gemstones, it's a lot more, less impactful because gemstones, Vongra <laughs> is coming up. Gemstones, you need to go and take them and the process of mining rocks is quite invasive. Um, and I do go to the UK to get the sigla, so you could consider the traveling being a bit uh, impactful, but I would go to the UK anyway to see um, friends at least once a year. I mean, I haven't been the last year, but I would go anyway, so I would try to match two things together and I'd have a lot of backup from uh, siglas that I collected over the years. Then for the other materials, I used silver that when the um, uh, supplier gives me the option, I always buy recycled si silver, but it's not always possible. So like for the sheets of silver, usually you can buy it recycled, because silver you can melt it and then do new stuff. Um, but it's not available for every option. In the future, I would love to have my own tools so that I can melt the silver and make sheets and wire myself. But for that, you do need a bit of money to buy the tools. But in the future, I would love to be able to do that as well. So I really strive to make jewelry that is the least impactful as possible and that will last your lifetime. So where do I get my siglas uh, in it now that I'm back in Italy? I don't, honestly, I haven't found a place that uh, where I can find siglas, to be honest. I have heard of a few places, but they're all in the south of Italy and I still need to investigate. So for now, I'm just using the backup that I have from the years that I spent living close to Siam. And yeah, I'm still open to finding um, new beaches in Italy. I have a last question on siglas. I wonder if you tumble any of the glass you find or you use it as you found it. I do not tumble any of the siglas that I find. Um, in the siglas world is not seen well to change in any way the siglas. Um, so there's absolutely no tumbling and there are ways of finding out whether your siglas is genuine siglas or tumble siglas. Um, I could make a video on my second channel about this because I'm not going to bore you with the details on that. But I will say that I do occasionally sand off um, little corners of the siglas. So if there's a nice piece of siglas but it's kind of pointy and I wouldn't be able to use it for uh, my jewelry, then I do round that point so that I can use it for my jewelry because I would find it a shame to not use that piece just because it's not perfectly round and there are some like purists of siglas that do not like that they don't want the siglas to be changed in any way but i think it's just silly because then you won't be using that siglas and nobody's going to be wearing it and what's the point another question that popped up a lot was what platforms do you use to sell your jewelry and do you have any tips on selling jewelry online and i use Let's see, which I have a love-hate relationship with. <laughs> when I started uh, selling over there, it was like this exciting new platform where there was really only handmade and artisanal stuff and really unique items. And now it's like a jungle. You can find anything in it. You can find like stuff that people buy from AliExpress wholesale and then they were selling Etsy. So you need to be careful what you buy. Always do a e Google search. Google reverse image search anytime that you need to buy anything. My workflow with Etsy, it works okay. They do take a big cut and they increase the cut every year pretty much. Um, I think now it's about 15% of my sales, not even more, which is a lot. Um, but they make it easy, they make it so easy. Otherwise, I've heard that TikTok is really good as well. Um, I haven't tried it myself. Uh, and I know TikTok is for younger generations, like Gen Z, Instagram is more millennials, and then Facebook is for boomers. So it also depends on the kind of audience, the kind of client that you have. Let's talk about money. One of you asked if this is uh, profitable, and I'll start by saying that if you want to make big money, then don't go into the artisanal, handmade, artistic, realm of work because that's not where the money lies at least not for the majority of people that said there are people that make this uh, a full-time job but how much profitable it is depends just so much on the on so many factors like the materials where you are in the world what is your audience whether you're good at promoting yourself there's just so many variables uh, so it's hard to 
answer this question. Somebody else also asked, do you pay taxes? And oh lord, do I pay taxes? Yes, I pay taxes. Um, this again changes where you are. I can give you an answer for Italy. Um, in Italy, they are ruthless with artisans. They're really ruthless. I had my business in the UK and it was much, much, much easier to run it. And now in Italy, I'm really struggling. Um, but that said, if you are in Italy and you just want to do like a hobby kind of thing, they let you sell stuff without paying my tax much taxing. I mean, I think you pay taxes on it, but you don't have to be registered until 5,000 euros. But yeah, if you make more than a certain income, then you will have to pay taxes. I think in most countries in the UK, it was, I think if you're self-employed, you have 12,000 pounds where you don't have to pay taxes. In Italy, if you have one euro, if you make one euro, you will have to pay taxes on it. Somebody also asked, how do you price your items? And I know this is quite difficult, um, but I can tell you the formula that might help you, which is material costs. So for me, let's say this ring, I can just weigh it and see how many grams of silver it is and I can know exactly how much I paid the supplier for this silver. Then you add the costs of your labor. So if this took me three hours and I pay myself 10 euros an hour, that will be 30 euros. And then I add like around 30% for taxes and um, accountant fees, Etsy fees, like maintenance of this place and of the tools. Like sometimes I need to buy more tools and you know, I want to have some money to be able to do that. Um, and then if you want to put a profit on that, then it's up to you, like 10%, 15%. It is the day after. Um, when I started filming this video, I really thought that I would be able to get everything done, all the jewelry and the video in one day. What a fool I was, what a fool. Um, I had to go back to the vet. Uh, we got the test results back and he they just confirmed that he has a pancreatitis, which is not, not nice. Um, but they don't know what the cause is, so we'll see if the treatment works. Otherwise, we'll have to go and get him scanned for that and probably like a bit of biopsy. But yeah, so yeah, I've been really worried for him those last few days, but he seems to be doing better. Um, anyway, so today is the day where I'm going to be finishing the jewelry because I'm done with the soldering. I just need to set the stone and then polish it. I have a few more questions that I wasn't sure what to put, so I thought I would answer them at the end. Um, what's something you wish you would have known when you started your business? I definitely, if I was to go back, I would be better at bookkeeping. Uh, I mean, in fact, when I started, I didn't do any bookkeeping. I was really bad. And then tax season would come around and I'd be like scrambling around trying to find the receipts for the whole year. It was horrible. Um, so now I'm better at it. Uh, as I also have an accountant that deals with the more complicated stuff um, but yeah I think that once you start having a business even if it's a side business you really need to have an excel sheet where you keep track of what's coming in and what's going out the suppliers where you're buying your stuff from because sometimes I would buy something and then I would forget which shop I bought it from and then it would be hard to get it back uh, things like that just keep track onto an excel sheet or like even just a uh, notepad of your expenses and how much you're making so it's going to make things much easier when tax season comes around how do you stay consistent i've tried to start creative business but i soon lose momentum i hate marketing too girl i get you i hate marketing um yeah it's not that's a hard thing when you are self-employed like you have your own business you have to do everything uh, you have to make stuff, find the suppliers, um, upload it, take pictures, be good at bookkeeping, um, do marketing. So it's normal that you have sides of the business that you enjoy less. Um, in terms of being consistent, I am not consistent. I'm just not. Um, I might have periods where I do like two weeks full on production and then I'll I photograph and upload that to the site and that will last me for a few months usually if I don't have like huge amount of sales and then when I see that on the site I have less than let's say 50 products then I might do another production um, week and this is how I do it I'm not one of those people that you know does the same amount of work for the same projects every day I'm more like I concentrate on one thing whether it's videos or jewelry or walls or woodworking and then I kind of switch when I see fit for it. Um, I don't know if it's important to be consistent, like as long as you have, let's say, a hundred products that are on the site, if they're not selling, you just have to wait. And then once they're selling, 
you need to upload more and you're gonna be motivated because you had a sale so this is at least how I see it I'm gonna tumble the pieces now so this is what a tumble is like you can use it for stones or for jewelry and it just creates a nice polish I'm gonna leave it a few hours here and then I'll show you the end result the three pieces are done and they turned out really lovely i just need to make like another 100 of those before the craft fair so wish me good luck and don't forget to go and check out the c7 flexi spot chair i will leave the link in the description bar and you can get an extra 50 dollars off your purchase with my discount and you also get a 30 day free trial so hope this video was interesting and i shall see you very soon bye